Good afternoon. This is Between the Lines at SandusküRegister.com. We're back. I'm Matt Westerhold, Managing Editor of the Register. My guests today are Jeremy Normington Slay, the, Chief, the CEO of Firelands Regional Medical Center, the Firelands Health Systems, and Dr. Scott Campbell, the Chief Medical Officer of Firelands Health Systems. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, the pandemic. And it's an update. Uh, these two men were my guests, our guests, uh, March 21st, and we're glad to have them back. Before I introduce them, I want to mention that Between the Lines is brought to you by Serving Our Seniors for Erie County residents age 60 and better. If you need help, call Serving Our Seniors at 419 419-624-1856. <laughs> And with that, we'll introduce Dr. Scott Campbell and Jeremy Normington Slade. Dr. Scott Campbell, of course, has the doctor's jacket on. Right. And Jeremy, you have the CEO's jacket. <laughs> Thank right. you for coming right. back. Uh, we certainly appreciate you being here. And we certainly appreciate, of course, all the work you're doing and, and the signs in front of the hospital, heroes work here. We agree with that. We, we love that. We know you're working hard and, and you, you did a lot of prep how are things going? Go ahead. I'll take this one. Right. Well, you know, I, it's, it's interesting because we, we took so long uh, to prepare and plan. And the mode we were in four or five weeks ago was, um, you know, bordering on insanity. It's, right. you, know, you wake up with a thought at three in the morning, you can't go back to bed and you think straight through till 11 or 12 at night and Dr. Campbell reading every article he can find. And, um, but I think that level of preparedness and heightened uh, awareness has prepared us well. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think we were just talking this morning that we've had um, almost 50 patients through our COVID unit. Now, not all of those uh, turned out to be uh, positive, of course, uh, but the ones that were positive that we've cared for in the hospital, uh, we feel really good about the preparation that we've done. and. Um, really good about the plans that we have in place. You know, are we waiting for more uh, uh, certain items? Absolutely, but uh, all in all, uh, we feel good. I guess the one thing that's just what we're trying to get our hands around now is that um, for so long we were anticipating this huge spike and then downward trend and it'd be over in four to six, eight weeks. Right. Now we're trying to prepare for this, what could be a year or two uh, of, right. a, of a COVID situation. Right. So that's where we focus, but as far as what the team has done uh, over the past six, eight weeks, it's been phenomenal. It really has. Dr. Hill, you want to add to that? Yeah, I think, I think the, the biggest thing for us is, as we sat here with you in March was, what are we going to get? All right, so we're just waiting for this massive tsunami to come and our resources to be overwhelmed. And we're watching all the other countries and what the crushing defeat they were having and things like that. And I think, that, like you said, that we were just under such tense uh, uh, meetings and how are we going to get this ready and how are we going to prepare and so we did all that we put our forces out there we got everything uh, you know additional staffing additional places for the patients you see our tents that are up we got everything ready and then it didn't happen and so but and, which is good but yeah and we'll take that all day long right, right. we've said that right. over and over the last thing we wanted was to have that happen choose who gets a ventilator and all the stuff that we see everywhere right, else so right. it didn't happen but what what i've always said over and over is this if, if if it's your family member that was sick from this disease it doesn't matter if a thousand people showed up or two people showed right, up right, right? it's right. the same illness for that person right. that's in your family right. and you know so for the people that have come to our facility and that have been ill or have been in the icu this is as real to them as if nobody showed up so we understand uh -huh. that and so I think that's where we had to reconcentrate our mind to say, and I always say this, that the disease is no less deadly because not everybody has, it. you know, not everybody swarmed our doors. We did a good job. Everybody stayed home. The, everything we asked them to do, tamp down the curve. And it, we didn't overwhelm our resources at the hospital, which was our plan, right? Uh -huh. And so our plan was that when you did get there with the disease, and we've had people with the disease, that we were able to take care of them with the best resources. Uh, the doctors weren't overwhelmed, the intensive care doctors, the emergency room doctors, they could do what they needed to do for these people and that has paid off for us. And so now we're readjusting, as they say, the new norm. What are we gonna do going forward as this thing still is around? And you know, what happens next? We, nobody knows, there's a lot of guesswork and our hospital guesses as well. So we wanna be prepared, but how do we step into the next phase of this? And 
you don't know what's going to happen next. So you have to remain as prepared as you were, but you bought time. So, you, you know, your, what is your PPE situation, personal protective equipment? You know, how is that going? And does that look better in the future if, if there is a, a uh, second wave? Yep. Well, and, and you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what we're preparing for is what could the spikes be? I mean, we just were on a phone call last week with one of the CEOs um, about 50 miles from here in the Toledo region, not, um, not much bigger than our hospital and they have 50 uh, COVID patients on any given day. Mm -hmm. And we know that with uh, our different uh, um, nursing homes in the area and vulnerable populations, we, we could spike up to those levels. And so right. that is what we're preparing for. We've also said that the amount of protective equipment that we have right now is good for these new standards, allowing us to reuse masks, yeah, yeah. Allowing, uh, allowing us to use washable gowns and, and some of the other uh, things that we're doing. But according to how that equipment was meant to be used in healthcare. If we went back to that way, we'd be out of a lot of our items within a week. It wouldn't even be questionable. So yeah, I mean, we feel good uh, that we have the items we need under the new guidelines, but we're nowhere near where we need to be long-term. So to, to follow up on that question, so we need to know what we have now that we can use going forward, okay? So if we have a certain percentage of these patients, we're gonna need personal protective equipment for some time to come. But we also kind of have to sit on a certain amount to say, what if? What if the nursing homes flare up? What if there's a big second spike? Do we have enough for that? So we're always looking at it. Well, as a layperson, uh, you know, I, I'm under the impression that in the next few weeks, in the next, certainly in the next two months, that there will be a resupply of PPE, that, that the manufacturers will have kicked it up, and, and you will it won't be as difficult to get. Is that, uh, you don't know. We would like to think. I think what we found out was with everything through this pandemic is don't count on anything they say is coming. When you see it in your hands, then it came. So there'll be an order and you think it's gonna be there Monday and for the three weeks later, it hasn't come yet. Yeah. So yeah, and I noticed the, the reluctance to, to you know, go down that road and that makes sense. Well, what about, and, and speaking of that then, what about testing? You know, we hear a lot about testing um, there's two types of testing, and you explained this in a, in a register story recently. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So, so there's the, the main test that everybody knows about, and we call it the PCR test. Basically, that's the test. It's a nasal swab. They do that, and they find out, do you have the disease or do you not have the disease? Okay, so if it's positive and says you have the disease, it's very useful. We also know that it can, be, it can say it's negative and still be positive because certain, there's multiple reasons for that. So I talked about that false negative rate of that test. So that's the one we've been dealing with so far, and that's the only test most people have had so far. And that's the test when the president's on there talking about we don't have enough tests, we didn't get enough tests. It's all about this PCR nasal swab. Uh -huh. And so we haven't had enough. We, we had limitations. One was on the test media that you send the test tubes. We didn't have enough of that. Of course, as I said, you say it's ordered, it never shows up. Right. The whole country's on back order. Well, finally, right. we got enough of that, and then we didn't have enough of the test to swabs. And then we have to use other labs to turn around the testing. Well, then Firelands was fortunate enough to be able to do some in-house testing. So we have access to that, but again, that's limited. So, so there, when you say in-house testing, yes, yes, at, at the that hospital. That means you process the, the test? Yeah, we do the nasal swab, we run the test, we get the result in our institution. So that's good. That's yep. excellent. So you're very proud of that. Yeah, that absolutely. You're able to do that. Yeah, and the lab was really good at being at the forefront of getting that in our place, you know, as opposed to the other stuff we send out, utilize the Cleveland Clinic, we utilize uh, UTMC in Toledo, and they helped us run our swabs until we were able to get some in-house testing. And it's still a, a variety of each to try to get through everything we need. And then there's a tiered system as to who gets tested. Right. Uh, the government put it out. We've been abiding by that anyway. And so we look at where do we most judiciously use our tests? And so that means, you know, patients that are sick, patients that are admitted to our hospital, our healthcare providers, our first responders. And so we use the test, you know, if I, I don't have enough to test to say, okay, all of Sandusky, let's test right. you. We wouldn't have and enough. that hasn't so changed. Has uh, not it, changed. Those are the CDC guidelines, the guidelines that uh, the Ohio Department of Health is Correct, is that's what we follow, absolutely. Correct. You know, and again, then from a, a layman's term or, or a layman's point of view, um, you you explained you know that ramping up for massive testing 
that's one of the problems. It's one of the reasons there isn't uh, wide-scale testing available because this has never been done before. For sure, yeah, and, and, and they say, you know, you think about it, this is a disease we had never seen, and then all of a sudden we see it in January, and all these labs have to figure out how do I test for this disease, and to be able to ramp up as much as we have, as I said, was pretty darn impressive, I think, but it's never enough, and we, you know, we're not gonna be able to test everybody with that kind of test. Uh -huh. So that moves on to the next type of testing, which you hear about all the time, that's the antibody testing. Right. So with the antibody testing, that actually looks at whether you've built antibodies, you've built a response to the illness. And once that goes up, you get tested. And that's what they always talk about, these people having a past that says, hey, I've had the disease, I'm immune to it. And the problem with that is they've not proven that just because you make the antibodies that you are immune to the disease. Everybody out there thinks you're going to be. How long, they don't know. How well protected, they don't know. With certain diseases, we are protected, and some diseases we aren't, depending on which disease you look at. Different viruses, influenza, for example. If you get it, you're probably safe the rest of that year, even if you didn't have the vaccine. Uh -huh. But with but, this disease, you don't know. We, nobody knows. Yeah. It's new. So they're going to want to test a lot more people in these epidemiology studies to say, like, how many people have it in the state or in New York? You'll see some of those on the news. That's antibody testing. Uh -huh. So that's different than this PCR test. Now, is that becoming available in Ohio? It is becoming available. And, and, and again, I'm going to say kudos to our lab folk because they've worked really hard to be on the cutting edge of this stuff. And I think we will have uh, availability of that very soon here at the hospital. Again we have limitations. So we can't just say, yep, we have it, and we have a million doses, you know. Come that on kind of, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's always gonna be, okay, now, now we have it, how much do we have? Are we gonna get resupplied next week? Or are we not gonna get resupplied next week? If the surge comes, do we have enough to take care of the hospital? So we always have to have that in the back of our mind. What if we don't get resupplied? Um, do we have enough to do what we need to do to take care of the sick patients? And so we're gonna roll that out just like we did the other testing in a very wise way to the right people. And so Governor Mike DeWine uh, recently, yesterday or the day before, announced that there will be some limited reopening of some businesses. Does that concern you as health care providers? Well, I mean, I think the one thing that he stressed um, in the last few days is that, you know, some of the unintended consequences of this situation that we're in, the shelter at home, is that there are folks who really do need health care who've delayed it. Right. And so we're talking a lot about the cost of delaying health care. And I think uh, Scott had quoted some stats about the, the reduction in um, certain visits to the ER. Well, we don't necessarily think those episodes uh, needing care are there. They're just not coming into our, our hospital. So we do, have, uh, we do have concerns about that. And I think when you heard Dr. Acton yesterday talk about if you have a newborn uh, and you have a wellness visit that you canceled last month, you don't want to let that go another three or four months. So you need to get in. So when we look at our, both of our outpatient providers, our doctor's clinics, and I know our independent providers and gnomes are going through the same discernment, it's trying to let the public know that if you have a needed healthcare visit, we, we will provide a safe place. We'll make sure that you're not sitting next to someone who's not wearing a mask in a waiting room within six, six feet. We'll make sure to get you in and out quickly and safely. And the same goes to our, for our hospital. So I don't know, Scott, you want to talk a little bit about what we're doing at the, at the hospital to make sure folks are safe when they come into the ER as well. Yeah, yeah. so, so <clears throat> well, the real thing is that, you know, we put off all this stuff. He said, stay at home for us. We're here. We'll stay here for you, right? That's the, and we wanted people with the minor illnesses and the colds and stuff to stay home. We didn't want people to stay home with their heart pain symptoms, with their abdominal pain that we don't know what it is yet, uh, with their foot that doesn't have blood supply to it. But as a consequence of this, us and around the country, we've seen a marked decrease in regular uh -huh. visits to the emergency room and to the hospital. And so there has to be, there's unintended consequences of letting that stuff fester. Uh, and, you know, I could go through a million examples. If you didn't see, you know, the tip of the iceberg where you saw that there was blood and pain somewhere that somewhere, uh, to be specific, say urinary blood, and you had pain in your back, and that turns out to be something really bad, but you didn't get it go looked at, go get it looked at like you would have. That could be a tragic mistake. Right, right, right. And so we want to say it's time for people to start getting those things taken care of again. It's time for, and our, our message is, you know, from the hospital standpoint, from the emergency room standpoint, that we're going to be as safe a place as anywhere. We're going to really take our, you know, keep you safe. Everyone's going to wear a mask. You're going to wear a mask. We want people to get their, you know, and that's, that's across the country. And the study he was talking about, 
They talked about how many less um, heart attacks, basically. And they took multiple institutions across the nation. 28% decline in heart attacks in, since the COVID started. We know that's not true. Uh -huh. We just know people didn't come in. And Ooh. so therefore, they may have sat home with heart pain, had some damage to their heart, and just oh. never came in. So then they end up with the consequences of some heart failure and oh, other things. That so is, that is just kind terrible. of an example of why we need to get people back into being taken care of here. And so what you're saying, I think, uh, what I'm hearing is, is if you have a, uh, a doctor's appointment that's important, and your doctor says you need to keep this appointment, you should keep the appointment. Absolutely. And you're not going, you know, pe people suffering from COVID-19 symptoms are not going to be in the doctor's office. Uh, they're going to be in the, in the emergency room, I imagine. Or, well, it, well, we would still handle those similarly. If someone comes in with COVID-like or has COVID-like symptoms at home, we're still asking them to call their provider first right. to do a telemedicine visit, and we'll get them tested appropriately and through our uh, and through our screening process, so that we don't have you know as much as we can. Um, if we know someone is exhibiting those symptoms, we wouldn't have them sitting in a waiting room next right. to another patient. Absolutely. And so what you're urging uh, viewers and readers to do is, is not delay their health care uh, uh, needs, especially yeah. acute, chronic, yeah. uh, or uh, unknown symptoms yeah, of, an, of an unknown nature. Yeah. Get help. Just so we're gonna... And you can start with telemedicine. How is telemedicine? Yeah, I was going to say that that's probably one of the silver linings in all of this is that we do think there will be increased comfort with that long term. Um, so that is a good way uh, to start, but it, it doesn't necessarily take the place of a physician putting their stethoscope on your on your heart right. and listening or listening to your lung sounds or or giving you a thorough um, uh, examination. So that that is a silver lining for sure, but it's not the end all be all. Yeah, and, but but you know the patient would be like you'll have a lot more information about your own personal condition if you have a chance to talk to a professional yep. versus trying to figure it out, 100%, <laughs> which 100%. is not a good idea. And mm -hmm. the beauty of the, the telemedicine is that if the provider says, hey, this is something I really need to see, you know, just to give you a more in depth examination, please come into the office. That that's very true. And then are you restarting some elective surgeries? We are. So, you know, as, as anybody that watches the governor and how we're doing this, you know, we initially, I think it was March 17th, they put out the order. Um, all non-essential surgeries, all elective surgeries canceled. All right, we're just going to take the ones that are a threat to people's lives, you know, cancers that are spreading, things that really needed to go emergently or traumas, right. et cetera. Right. And that was to protect everybody from this unknown illness that was coming. And it was to protect the PPE supply because surgery uses a lot of PPE. So now they've relaxed those rules to say, let's go back on the cases that you put off, maybe something you wanted to do, but you couldn't. Let's go back and revisit those. Let's not have people sitting out there in pain that we can do something about. And safely. The, yeah, yeah. And some of the outpatient procedures can start back up. We're not in a... Uh, Everybody's open free for all uh -huh, yet, uh -huh. but the idea is to open that back up. Now with us, we have to do multiple things to make that happen. One is make people safe. So if you're gonna come to our hospital and have your elective procedure done, we wanna make sure you're safe. Did we take all precautions that if you come to the hospital to get this done, that our doctors are and their nurses and everybody takes care of you to keep you safe when you're coming in to get it done. And the other thing is we have to now monitor the PPE again. Uh -huh. So now we're gonna bring all these procedures back. We just go full bore and open it all up. Within a few weeks, we'd be out of everything. And what if another COVID spike comes? So those are the kind of things we're working on. But uh, definitely some stuff that's been put off. Time to talk to your doctor about something that maybe they told you four weeks ago, six weeks ago. Right. Hey, we're gonna wait on that until we know what's going on with us. I think we're at a point now because of the, just the prevalence of the disease in our community that we can start doing some of those procedures again. And when you say prevalence in our community, we're, we're doing pretty good. Doing really well, yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, and we, we do the, uh, and the state and the, the health departments and, and your hospital are all being forthright with the information to keep people informed. We get daily reports with the Firelands logo on there. Uh, I think that's a combination of, of the groups that are working together that absolutely. we're getting that from. Um, what about staying healthy in isolation? Is it isolation? I mean, some of us are isolated. Some of us are isolated with our families, uh, which could be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, how, about, how do you stay healthy in this type of uh, situation? 
What do you recommend? Yeah, just the, 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 the big thing I think is two things. It's, it's physical health and it's mental health. Uh -huh. And so you know, it's nothing's changed. In other words, if you took care of yourself generally, stayed fit or relatively, I'm not talking about going crazy. I'm just saying stay relatively fit, get some exercise and eat right. Then when the virus of any kind shows up at your door, you're going to be more prepared for it. You're going to be less ill. If you're not smoking all day long and eating wrong and, you know, obesity and everything that goes with that, then you're going to do worse. We know that that's what this disease is all about, right? Comorbidities. So the, the one of the questions came up was like, what can I do different if I were to get this in the fall to give me a better chance? Uh -huh. And then, you know, my answer is, you, know, you take care of yourself, all right? You start getting some exercise. People can take two paths on this, right? They can sit and eat, not do anything because they're depressed. And then if you get out and you exercise and you can eat right, then that also leads to better mental health, which helps you deal with the virus. And so we just kind of wanted to get that yeah. message out, you know, as to what we thought you should do to, you know, that, something you can do. Because, you know, we don't have a lot you can do for this. And, and, and that, uh, you know, safe distance is six feet, uh, wearing masks outside. But you can go for a walk at Lions Park uh, on the path there and keep a safe distance. It's not hard at all. Uh, there are plenty of places where you can go outside and get exercise. You can get exercise at home, too. Yep. So I think what you're saying is stay healthy to improve your chances of not becoming ill, and if you do become ill, to improve your chances of a quicker recovery. Right. Absolutely. And, and again, especially when we're talking about, I, I think, uh, again, Dr. Campbell, I think he said something that the average vaccine time is like three to four year, years under normal circumstances. Right. So let's say we can speed that up. And I think there's a lot of hope that it could be earlier than that. But if this does last six to 12 months, there's a chance that a lot more people are going to get this. And how do we best prepare ourselves? So it's, it's, you know, two things we've talked about today. Number one, don't be putting off that necessary health care that you've been putting off because we asked you to in some parts, right. you know, the stuff that could be put off. Uh, and number two, take care of yourself. And if you do those two things, you're going to be best able to deal with this over a longer period of time. And that only helps us and, and society out. Very good. Uh, was there anything else we wanted to talk about or did we did we cover everything? I think I, I got all my questions. Yep. Asked. No, 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 I think, I think that's great. I think well, I want to thank you so much again for for always being available to yeah. take our questions and help us keep the readers informed. We really do appreciate it. Uh, and I don't want you taking too much time answering my questions. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> yeah. I'm always surprised when I get your response. I'm like, oh, I didn't want him to answer oh, these no. questions. Oh, okay. That's what I but I, I really do appreciate it. Yep. Uh, I did want to mention Aaron Caldwell's producing this segment of Between the Lines. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Thanks, Matt. This has been Between the Lines at SanduskyRegister.com. You can watch this program on demand at the Register's YouTube page or at our website. Thank you.